My fiancé seemed perfect until my sister's investigation revealed his hidden life of crime. Now I'm torn between confronting him or staying far away. I, 24, female, started dating my fiancé, 26, male, two years ago. I didn't really like him at first, but after continued persistence on his part, I gave in and said yes to going out on a date. He was very happy about it. He took me out to a fancy hotel and was very gentlemanly. I was impressed. He asked me out again and I said yes. After going out for three months, he asked me to be his girlfriend and I accepted. In this time period, I had developed feelings for him and he had too. Everything was going pretty well. He was romantic and passionate and we were in love. Two years later, he proposed and I was jumping for joy. I screamed yes when he asked me. My whole family had met him except my sister. My sister moved abroad after attending university here. It was a huge opportunity and we supported her. My sister is a few years older than me. I have flown to visit her a couple of times, but her schedule is too packed for her to come down here. I wanted her to meet my boyfriend, now fiancés, but alas, we couldn't set anything up. He was busy with work and couldn't fly with me. When I told my sister I was engaged, she was excited for me. She promised that she would take time off from work to come down for my wedding. I was elated. While discussing wedding plans with him, we got to talking about the guest list. Nothing was set as we decided to be engaged for a year and get married the next. I hadn't told him that I spoke to my sister, but I mentioned that she may come down for our wedding. I wanted it to be a surprise. He had mentioned a few times how sorry he was that he couldn't take time off to visit her, so I thought he would be happy when he finally met her. I didn't know much about his work. All I knew was that he was a portfolio manager and investor. I didn't ask many questions, but he did make me aware that he was financially comfortable and planned to retire early. I was a fresher in the fashion industry back then and was just starting out. He was very supportive of my career, telling me to take my time. We gelled nicely. When we started looking at different venues for the ceremony, he was there. He didn't miss out on any of the wedding decisions, and I loved that. The date had been set, and it was sooner than expected. There were only a few months left until the wedding. We had started putting down some deposits for the bookings. Not everything was booked yet, though. One day, I got a call from my sister. She told me that she was going to be flying out early and will be here for around six months for business purposes. I was so excited. My sister was coming down early and not only for a day, but for a whole six months. Of course, I didn't expect her to be around me all the time. After all, she was here for business purposes, but we would still be closer together and she could help decide some stuff when she had time. I really valued her opinion. My to-be husband obviously didn't know about this. It was going to be a huge surprise and he was going to get a chance to actually bond with her like he did with the rest of my family. I told him that my sister was not sure if she was going to make it to our wedding. He seemed a little disappointed and I felt bad, but I didn't want to ruin the surprise. He then told me to remove her name from the guest list as she wasn't sure if she would be coming, but I refused. I told him that she may come, so I didn't want to remove her name from the guest list. He insisted that if she were to come, then we could add her name back. But for now, we needed to finalize the list and RSVP everybody. I agreed with him, but I obviously didn't take her name off the list. Soon the day came. My sister would be landing today. I convinced him that one of our family members was flying out early and that we needed to go pick them up. He didn't mind. While we were waiting at the airport, he asked me again who it was, and I just told him it was a distant family member. I didn't want to give away anything. I finally saw my sister, and we rushed to hug each other. We were giggling and laughing. It had been so long, and I missed her. My fiancé was surprised. He smiled, came forward, and hugged her, too. They were exchanging greetings and introducing themselves to each other face to face for the first time. We went home, and my family was feeling emotional, too. They hadn't flown out as much as me, so they hadn't seen her in person for a longer period of time. A few days passed, and I set up a little coffee date for the three of us. I wanted them to bond, but I didn't want it to be awkward. So we met up. Everything was going well. She asked questions about his family, and they were getting to know each other, but it became a little awkward when she started asking him questions about his work. I didn't notice at first, but he was evading a lot of her questions. I thought it may just be in my mind. After breakfast, he said that he had something urgent come up, so he had to leave. I was fine with it. I hung out with my sister a little more. She asked me about his work, 
but I told her I didn't know much about it. I told her what he told me, that he was a portfolio manager and investor. I asked what was going on in her head and she told me not to mind her. She told me to set up a few more dates between us. I could tell she was curious about his work. Every time we hung out, she would raise questions about his work and he'd make up a reason and leave. I started noticing a pattern and I didn't know what it was about. I tried asking him directly, but he told me that he didn't know what I was talking about. My sister told me that she wanted to do a little digging about his work just for fun, saying curiosity got the best of her. I thought she was getting paranoid, but I was curious too, so I let her do her thing. What harm could a little curiosity do? Around two months passed and out of nowhere, I got a call from my sister in the middle of the night asking me where I was. I told her I was at home and asked her if everything was all right. She sounded so worried and concerned. She told me that she wanted to meet up with me immediately. It was in the middle of night, so I kept asking her what it was about. I asked her to come over, but she refused. Eventually, I relented and went to her. She was staying with my parents. When I reached there, everybody was awake. It looked like they were waiting for me. I was confused. I asked them what this was about. My sister made me sit down and showed me a few documents. She explained them to me and I was shocked in horror. I couldn't believe all the papers that lay before me. It turns out my to-be husband was related to a lot of shady people. I don't mean as just business partners, but as in related, as in family related. And from what I knew, he didn't have any family in the country. His so-called portfolio management was actually some type of fraudulent scheme and he had gotten away with it for years. He was committing fraud and had been doing it for years. I couldn't understand how no one caught him. I wanted to confront him about this face to face, but my family refused to let me go, saying it was too dangerous. They told me to get the cops involved and I had no option but to do so. The cops had enough evidence for an arrest warrant. He got arrested. That day, I was emotionally distraught. I was in disbelief. I still hadn't processed what had happened. My sister had gotten suspicious of him and had hired a professional private investigator to get information on him. She couldn't figure it out herself. He hadn't tried to reach out to me. I had a feeling he knew that I had gotten the cops involved. My family was helping me take down the deposits for the bookings. I was in an emotional wreck and just stayed with my sister and parents. I don't know what is going to happen next or if I should contact him or not. Update 1. One month later, the evidence wasn't enough to take it further. My family is very confused. He was released from prison. My sister contacted the private investigator again, but he warned us to stay away. It was as if he was telling us to not escalate the situation and to just let it go. I don't know what is happening. My ex fiance still hasn't contacted me. Update 2. Two weeks later, he contacted me. He says he wants to meet, meet me at his place. I refused. I want to meet him, though. I want to ask him to his face about what's going on. The situation was clearly more complex than we had anticipated. I want answers. What should I do? Girl, keep your ass in the house and do not go to his place. I don't owe him anything. Send back everything that belongs to him and cut him off. This is the safest option. Info, I need more info on what he was involved in. But you won't get those answers unless you meet him. Maybe meet him somewhere more public. I think OP shouldn't have called the cops on him so fast. She was obviously influenced by her family. He may be innocent, you know. It may not be as bad as your sister made it seem. Not related, but I think he may still have feelings for you. No wonder he's asking to meet. Next story. We live on campus and my roommate of this year, Lila, is the best one I had the pleasure of living with so far. There's just one thing. She keeps some of her friend's food supplies in our room since theirs is cramped and there's no space. So her two friends have been going in and out of our room frequently. At first, they would always knock before going in and say hi, but over time, I told them it's fine if they don't knock and they're welcome to go in any time. Two weeks ago, though, this girl, Z, moved in with them and I don't like her one bit. She didn't really do anything outrageously wrong, but the way she feels entitled to just barge into my room when we're practically strangers and not even talk to me got on my nerves. Plus, she woke me up several times with how violently she opened the door. So I told Lila that when I initially agreed to her friends coming in, I wasn't expecting such a big number and that the way the door is being opened would jolt me awake. She was good about it. 
and said she'll ask them to knock from now on. Z only knocked for two days before she suddenly barged in again yesterday, searched around for what she needed, then walked out without so much as looking at me. So I got up and locked the door. When Z came later, she was forced to knock and I only opened the door to a slit and told her I'm sorry Lila isn't in the room. She said she just wanted to grab something, but I told her I'm sorry the only reason I've been letting them go in is because of Leela on the condition that they knock. But since she wouldn't, she would have to go through Leela from now on. She got mad and said she's not here to see my pretty face, but because she was hungry and that the room is not just mine. I didn't want to debate this with her, so I closed the door and locked it again. When Leela came back, I thought she'd be on my side, but she actually told me I should have talked to her first and not do this directly to her friend. She said Z wasn't required to greet me, but that she'll talk to her again about the knocking. I told her she wasn't hearing me, that Z is no longer welcome with or without knocking unless she's here. She said I was being unreasonable and we'll talk again. Well, we haven't since then and none of her friends came by again. Am I the a-hole here? Nah, it's your room too and you have a right to decide who has access and when. Obviously, so does Lila, but especially when you are there alone. You've been pretty lenient, but that led to the access being abused, so you set reasonable boundaries. Those boundaries are not being respected. Honestly, if it were me in my room, I'd be telling Lila that no one will be allowed access to your shared room unless she is present and that you'll be locking your door to visitors from now on. But that's your decision to make. I know my post made her out to be bad, but she was a good roommate until this happened. If she wanted to borrow something, she'd always ask me, my God, if she borrowed, let's say, my hair dryer, once she would not just go ahead and take it twice. No, she'd ask every single time. Do you know how precious this kind of behavior is? I've been with three roommates so far and I always had this problem with them. Also, I feel absolutely safe with her. I know she'd never take anything nor touch my bed or belongings without permission. Also, she gives little things back she borrows like the toilet paper roll when she gets paid when I have already forgotten about them. If it was someone else, I'll bet you they won't give it back until I've had to ask for it. This is why I was cool with the storing thing or her friends coming in and out. You treat me while I treat you well, I mean I'm with you. I've lived on and off campus and I didn't have a locker. I had a freaking backpack. These lazy weirdos should try it him out. I had an aunt who worked at my high school and had a microwave in her office that me and my cousins and our friends were allowed to occasionally use to skip the line for microwaves in the cafeteria. Instead of using this as an occasional privilege, my friends would purposely bring things that needed to be microwaved and try to barge into her office every day and not bring cutlery because they would just grab her plastic stuff that she pays for. But since I'm not in a hole, as soon as I saw this was happening, I shut it down and told them they'd been abused and lost the privilege to use it. They were pissed and tried to make fun of me and I just rolled my eyes and told them to grow up. They weren't my friends for long. Moral of the story sounds like OP's roommate needs to quit being a pushover. I am willing to bet the reason she took her friend's side is because her friends are putting pressure on her, which is childish and rude. She should be telling them to shut up and respect the no because they abuse the privilege or get lost. Next story. My 21 female live with my mother 37. She got pregnant extremely young and my father was never in the picture. My grandparents also died young so it's just me and her. My mother has this disgusting habit where when she gets mad at someone or something she yells at me. Not only yelling, she also tells me that she hates me, regrets having me, that I am extremely selfish and no good etc. We spent New Year's Eve separately. She was on a trip and I was at home with my boyfriend. She came home around 11 p.m. I was at home alone and was extremely tired because of the night before. When she passed through the door, she asked me if there was any milk in the house. Not asking how am I, not even saying hello. I said I didn't know because I don't drink milk usually and it's not something I checked. Then I checked and there was almost no milk in the house. She asked me why I didn't buy milk knowing she always drinks her coffee with milk. I said I just saw the box. I didn't check since I don't drink or use milk and also I didn't think that she would come home from a trip and immediately wanting coffee. She told me she had no coffee that day and I said there was no way I would know that. So she was yelling this whole time. That wasn't very unusual of her but then she started telling me that I'm selfish, ungrateful, unthoughtful, worthless human being. Basically a parasite living under her roof. 
I know it sounds like I'm leaving details behind, but I'm not. She told me all of these things because I forgot to check the milk. She goes on telling me that she does not want to live with me anymore. I should just go and live with my father that I am a burden to her. Then today came and I didn't leave my room. I didn't even eat or did anything outside of my room. She somehow found other things to yell at me, so she did just that. She saw some pants with black spots under and then just yelled at me saying the same thing she said the night before. I tried to be calm and I even apologized for forgetting, but she just went on and on and on about how I'm a worthless parasite who ruined her life. So in the end, I told her you are an extremely pathetic person. You will die alone and I will not buy you a grave. So as I was saying, this is her habit. This is what she does and I knew that and I knew if I didn't react to things she said, she would calm down eventually, but I couldn't do it this time. I just wanted to hurt her the way she hurts me, even though I know this is a wrong thing to do. I just wanted to know if the guilt I feel is valid or not. I want to be a better person than her and I know mirroring her behavior is not a way to do that. Damn, my mother behaved just like that. I fell into the trap of fighting back many times. I think this behavior is often known as borderline personality disorder. A toxic person will drain you emotionally. It's a cycle of guilt and anger because society dictates you respect your parents unconditionally. Don't let this guilt happen. I found it best to walk away. I left home at 18 and never went back. As an adult, I saw her on holidays and other family gatherings, but I remained detached. You have to take care of yourself. Staying to what you said was the absolute truth. When the time comes, don't let her guilt you into being there. She's obviously abusive and is blaming you for her own choices. I don't understand her point of view, frankly. I'm the single mother of an unplanned son who received no child support for most of his childhood. We had no clue where he was until Say finally found him. And things certainly would have been easier without him, but my life would have been so much emptier. That your mother doesn't see that proves she not only doesn't deserve you, but that she also deserves to end her days alone. It's definitely a harsh statement, but totally understandable why you said it. Sounds like your mom stopped growing developmentally after she had you. Her behavior is unpredictable and unacceptable. It sounds like she could use some professional help to deal with her issues. They are her issues. You shouldn't be the target of her anger when she can't deal with life. Get yourself out of this situation as quickly as you can. It's not a healthy relationship. You are not the parent and you have no reason to feel guilty. However, I suspect 21 years of this kind of relationship has seriously affected your ability to have a healthy relationship. You may want to think about getting some professional help for yourself. Ta, the burden of single motherhood is extremely ugly and not at all fair to anyone involved. Statistically, children that grow up without a father are heavily predisposed to many negative outcomes. The numbers are actually insane. The mother has to carry all of the burden with the help of subsidies, but I can imagine the stress of making the wrong choices early on in their life often manipulated into them, but that's an aside and having to deal with the consequences alone that must take its toll. Rather than find grace to resist against the cruelty of life, it sounds like your mother projected all of that nastiness onto you. You are not responsible for her problems, and she does not necessarily deserve hatred. She needs to stop feeling guilt for where her life went wrong and passing it on to you. That may never happen. Close your heart to it and try to find some compassion for the vestiges of your mother you love while you grow and move on from her. The father left a void. He may have been booted out by a crazy spouse or he could have been the shitty person that really deserves all of the hate here. Life's complicated. My relationship with my father had always been distant, but I never imagined it would become so painful. On his 20th wedding anniversary, he dropped a bombshell on me. He told me that I was not his child and kicked me out of the family. It was because he had found out that his ex-wife, my mother, had cheated on him. I was devastated by his words. How could he say such a thing? Did he really mean it? All my life, I had looked up to him as my father, my role model, my protector, but now he was rejecting me as his own. It felt like my world was crashing down around me. At the anniversary party, my father had gathered all of our relatives and friends to celebrate his marriage. As we all sat at the long dining table surrounded by festive decorations, he suddenly stood up and made his announcement. I remember the shocked silence that fell over the room as everyone looked at him in disbelief. I felt like I was in a nightmare, as if I was watching a movie and not living it. My father's words were like a knife to my heart, and I couldn't bear to be in the same room as him. So I got up from the table and ran out of the party, tears streaming down my face. Rushing to my mother's house, I couldn't hold back my tears. 
I told her what my father had said to me at his wedding anniversary party. My mother listened to me, holding me tight and reassuring me that everything would be okay. As I calmed down, my mother told me the truth about my biological father. She revealed that she hadn't cheated on my dad. I was, in fact, my father's biological daughter. She explained how hurtful it was to be accused of infidelity and how much pain my father's accusations had caused her. I felt both relieved and heartbroken at the same time. It was a relief to know that I was indeed my father's child, but the fact that he had doubted my mother's faithfulness was painful to hear. It made me question everything I knew about my family. Despite the revelation, I couldn't bring myself to forgive my father for his hurtful words and actions. The pain he had caused was too much to bear, and I decided to distance myself from him and the rest of my family. As soon as I left my mother's house that day, I knew I had to start over. I felt completely alone and abandoned, but I was determined to make the most of my situation. I had to start from scratch, but I was determined to make a life for myself without my father's presence. I had to learn how to be self-sufficient and rely on myself. I worked hard every day and saved as much money as I could. I had to prioritize my expenses and cut out unnecessary things from my life. It wasn't glamorous, but it was necessary. In the beginning, it was tough to do this without my father's advice and support. But as time passed, I started to build a new life for myself. I met new people and made new friends who supported me through the tough times. I started to pursue my hobbies again and even discovered new ones. Without my father's presence, I learned to value the relationships I had with other people in my life. My friends and co-workers became my new family and I learned to cherish their love and support. I also started to see a therapist to work through my feelings of abandonment and rejection. It wasn't easy to talk about my pain, but it was necessary for my healing process. With the help of my therapist, I was able to work through my emotions and come to terms with my father's rejection. Despite the pain and heartache, I slowly started to realize that I didn't need my father's approval or acceptance to be happy. I was strong and independent, and I had built a life for myself that I was proud of. Years went by and I continued to grow and flourish without my father's presence. I had accepted that he was never going to be a part of my life, and I was okay with that. I had my own family now, my friends, my therapist, and most importantly, myself. It wasn't until nine years later that my father reached out to me again, but by that time, I had already built a new life for myself. As I sat in my apartment staring at the phone in my hand, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My father, the man who had kicked me out of his life so many years ago, was calling me. After all this time, he wanted to talk to me again. I didn't know what to feel. Part of me was angry, hurt, and confused. How could he just expect me to forgive and forget after everything he had done? But another part of me was curious. I had always wondered what it would be like to have my father back in my life, to have a real relationship with him. So I took a deep breath and answered the phone. His voice sounded different now, older and full of regret. He apologized for everything, for kicking me out of his life and for the hurtful things he said to me. He explained that he had been going through a tough time back then and he took it out on me. He never meant to hurt me. As he spoke, I felt a range of emotions. Part of me wanted to scream at him and hang up the phone, but another part of me wanted to forgive him. I wanted to believe that he was genuinely sorry and that he wanted to make things right. After talking for a while, we decided to meet up. I was hesitant at first, but I knew I needed to see him in person. Update one. One week later, as I sat across from him in the coffee shop, I couldn't help but feel conflicted. That it had been years since I had seen my father, and now he was sitting here in front of me, looking remorseful and vulnerable. I didn't know what to say to him. He began by apologizing for what happened at his 25th wedding anniversary, but I cut him off. I told him how humiliated I felt when he announced to everyone that I wasn't his child, that I couldn't believe he could say something like that, especially in front of all those people. That I could see the pain in his eyes as he listened to me. He knew he had messed up, and I could tell he was genuinely sorry. But I wasn't ready to let him back into my life, just yet. I needed to know that he was serious about making amends. I told him that if he wanted to be a part of my life again, it was going to take more than a simple apology. He would have to prove to me that he was committed to making things right. I couldn't just forgive and forget everything that had happened in the past. He nodded solemnly, and I could tell he understood. We talked for a while longer, catching up on each other's lives. I found out that he had divorced my stepmother and had been going through a tough time. I felt a pang of guilt for not being there for him during those years, but I knew that it was important for me to put myself first. As we said our goodbyes, he told me that he hoped we could reconnect in future. I didn't make any promises, but I knew that I was open to the possibility. Maybe, just maybe, we could rebuild our relationship and start anew, but it was going to take time and effort on both our parts. Update two four months later. As time went on, my relationship with my father slowly improved. We began talking more frequently, and I even met with him a few more times. However, it wasn't until I heard from my mother that I knew something had truly changed in him. My mother told me that my father had reached out to her and apologized for his behavior. He admitted that he had been wrong to accuse her of cheating and abandoning me, and he expressed regret for the pain he had caused both of us. So my mother said that it was the first time in years that he had acknowledged his mistakes and taken responsibility for them. She was cautiously optimistic that he had truly changed, but she also cautioned me to take things slowly and be careful. I was happy to hear that my father had taken this step, 
but I was still wary. I had built a life for myself without him, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to let him back in so easily. It was going to take more than an apology for me to fully trust him again. My father continued to reach out to me and show that he was committed to making things right. He respected my boundaries and never pushed me to forgive him or spend time with him. Instead, he simply let me know that he was there for me if I ever needed him. NTA, the father's behavior was inexcusable. How could he kick his own child out of the family simply because he thought the child wasn't biologically his? He could have handled the situation with more maturity and empathy. Instead, he chose to react out of anger and hurt, which led to years of pain and separation. Even though he did eventually realize his mistake, it didn't take away from the fact that he hurt his own child in a deep and lasting way. I hope he realizes the gravity of his actions and works hard to make amends. The father's actions are absolutely disgraceful and completely unforgivable. To kick out your own child from the family simply because you suspect that their mother cheated on you is beyond shameful. It is an act of cruelty that no child should ever have to endure. The emotional pain and trauma the OP must have gone through is unimaginable. NTA, the father's behavior not only displays a complete lack of respect for his daughter, but it also shows a lack of empathy and compassion towards his ex-wife, whom he accused of infidelity without any concrete proof. Instead of talking to his ex-wife about his suspicions, he chose to make a spectacle out of it at his own wedding anniversary with his second wife, causing a scene and humiliating his own daughter in the process. It is clear that he was not ready to be a parent, and his actions prove that he was not mature enough to handle the responsibilities that come with raising a child. His decision to cut ties with his own flesh and blood is inexcusable, and even though he has now apologized, it is impossible to ignore the pain and trauma that he has inflicted on his daughter. In conclusion, the father's actions were selfish, cruel, and irresponsible. He may have realized the error of his ways, but he can never fully make up for the damage that he has caused. His daughter had to suffer for years because of his inability to be a responsible and loving parent, and that is something that should never be forgotten or forgiven. Next story. Me, 14, female. My twin sister Kate and our parents, 40s, live in a four-bedroom house. My parents have the master. The second room is a guest room. Dad uses the third room as an office, and my sister and I share the other room. The three regular bedrooms are small. Dad works from home two days a week, and we have guests maybe 10 days a year. I'm very outgoing. I like having people over, and Kate's an introvert who wants to watch her old TV shows and talk to her friends on Discord. She likes order, and I like putting my clothes on the chair without being yelled at. We've been asking to have our own room since we were nine, and my parents are refusing to move us because we don't have enough space for everybody's needs. Quarantine was awful. Kate and I fought all the time and our parents yelled at her when she moved her stuff to the guest room because mom has her craft stuff in the closet. And what if grandma had to stay with us for a while? I love my sister. But this is making me like her less, and sometimes I think she barely tolerates me because we're always in each other's space. We barely fit in here anymore. The closet is too small for our clothes. Kate's books are in stacks on the floor. I can't listen to music in peace, and my friends ask why we are sleeping in bunk beds in a four-bedroom house. Yesterday, I was looking for my hair curler and caused a book avalanche that knocked the USS Enterprise whatever off the desk. Kate was screaming. I was screaming, and she asked for the thousandth time to combine the guest room and the guest so she can take the other room. Dad said he absolutely needs an office. I said I absolutely need a closet, and it doesn't make sense to have all this space and put both his kids in a single room. Mom said we're not entitled to a bedroom each, and there are millions of children who share a room, and if we wanted more space, we should get rid of stuff and stop living like hoarders. Like we're sorry for being two separate people with two people's worth of belongings that you bought for us. I asked who is entitled to a room that's empty 346 days per year, or an office that's used twice a week, and why I'm the unreasonable one for wanting some space. After that, we were yelling in circles, and Kate took her laptop and locked herself in the guest room. Dad asked what she thinks she's doing, and she said googling nursing homes with bunk beds, which she did not at all. So, are we a holes? Today, my aunt and grandma visited and called us ungrateful for everything we have and were disappointed in us. I don't believe I'm an ass because I just am asking to use the space we already have, but at the end of the day, it's my parents' house, not mine. Kate and I wouldn't be angry if we lived in a two-bedroom house but four bedrooms, the one room just sitting there being a waste of square feet and taxes, and we have to share. NTA, but I laughed to tears about nursing homes with bunk beds. If my kids said that to me, I'd have a really hard time taking myself so seriously that I wouldn't fall over laughing. I do think a dedicated guest room and a dedicated office is a ridiculous waste when the family harmony would be drastically improved by separating children. My office is moving to the dining room because I can no longer use my daughter's closet as an office. She needs privacy and personal space. NTA, your parents, on the other hand, are prioritizing their own wants and needs over you and your twin. Sorry for the bum deal. Save up and move out as soon as you're old enough. 
You won't have to live like this forever, just until you can pay your own rent. Next story, 24 male here, talking about my 24 female Mara friend. They am organizing a birthday party at a bar in the city we live in for a mutual friend of ours. I rented out a portion of the bar with bottle service, so it cost about two grand. I a little over 20 people were invited, so I think each person paid around $80 to $90. I'm not quite sure what the number exactly was as people paid me a few weeks ago. Kimara was one of the people who paid me. She said something about misreading the dates, and she has some big thing with her sister that night, and she could not attend. Say so the fight we are having is Mara wants her money back. Well, she can't have her money back. So why? Because I already paid. Essentially, I would have to give her the money out of my own pocket to refund her. I currently live on my own, which I pay for pretty much all my bills, but my parents still send me a little bit of fun money a month. Not much like 200 bucks. This is honestly how I paid my share of the bar. Mara knows this. She's been bad-mouthing me, calling me mommy's money and shit. She's accusing me of being a spoiled, selfish prick, because I know she's worked for pretty much everything since high school and the money means a lot more to her than it does to me, I guess. I don't think my situation matters at all, and that is just extra details. Her poor planning is not my problem and just because technically I can afford to pay her doesn't mean I should. At the end of the day, she paid for it and didn't realize her schedule in conflict and that's on her. The last comment I had to her was, if you claim you work so hard, maybe go to work and make your money back instead of trying to shake down your friend and we haven't talked since. Edit. Other thought about refunding. Like wouldn't me refunding her now set the precedent that if anyone else had an issue, I'd now have to refund them too. Because I guess I must make this clear, I told everyone two days in advance that I would be paying the bar. Everyone said it was chill. Many are claiming the good friend would give her the money out of their pocket. Look, she's not like a best friend of mine. Not really someone I need to bend over backwards for. She's more the friend of a friend and we are friends through that. NTA. She should have checked her dates before confirming and handing over the money. I think it was pretty obvious that the total was being split between attendees. So, if she wants her money back, are you supposed to ask the other 18 or so for $5 extra? Are there any other friends who didn't make the guest list who you could ask in her place? Then they could pay her portion, and you could pass the money back. Next story, Ada for dropping of my employer's kids at her important meeting, TA as my main is linked to me, and I have received clients through it. I was an au pair before, and now I provide nanny services and annual babysitting services. A new contract is signed every year, there are no run-on contracts. I have three others working for me and the occasional team looking to make some extra cash. So one of my employees was done with a minor celebrity family abroad. This celebrity had recommended her to one of their run celebrity friends. I had a few families that weren't vetted on a list, but because she said she already knew the social circle, she wanted to start immediately due to cash flow and was willing to start before the formalities and paperwork was sorted out. The contract with base rate, extras, and holidays and all were signed and agreed upon before she started. Apart from some minor disagreements, her former celebrity employer was overall a good client, so I allowed her to start thinking their friend wouldn't be a hassle without vetting them. The first week went okay, and I got good feedback from her when I touched base with her. The second week there were some minor disagreements. The third week they didn't serve her food because they felt she was getting paid enough to get her own food. I contacted them and gave them a warning that they couldn't breach the contract and to reimburse her cost of food. They agreed to it, but the day after my employee contacted me and said they gave her what they thought she should use for food instead of her actual costs and she wanted to quit. I contacted them again and told them that there would be legal action if they didn't. They did begrudgingly but left a voicemail wondering why she felt the need to eat papayas and pineapples. Even though this is part of the children's diet, and as per the contract she would get the same food and other fancy stuff when she couldn't afford it. They also said people like her should stick to what is within the means of their budget. So I moved her out this placement and came to an agreement that I would take over her duties until I found them a different one. This is in line with the contract. It's my responsibility if a nanny is sick or otherwise not able to do the job, not the parents. The children were not the best behaved but due to their ages I let it slide. Things got bad for me during the fourth week as it was my weekend off. So when I woke up, she had written me a note taped to my bedroom door that she was gone for the weekend and that I should help her out this once as I had given her a faulty nanny to begin with. So it was in line with her character from what I had observed, but I was still shocked that she would pull this after me explaining the contract before taking over. I let it slide. When she returned, she came back with her husband. I sat them both down and told them that during my days off which they would be informed about minimum 14 days prior as per contract, they had to arrange their own childcare. In addition, I reminded them that as they had now been given two warnings, the third would void the contract. Wick was in the contract, so they tried to raise objections, but I reminded them that I was an employee, not a slave. Six weeks from then, which was yesterday, I was supposed to have the weekend off. When I woke up in the morning, the house was empty apart from the children, the bearded dragon, the duck, and the other animals. So if even Chef wasn't there, 
The note she had left stated that she was out entertaining her friends and co-workers at the beach and that she would be back by two. She said she would really appreciate it if I could do it just once more, as it was an important get-together. The children were more or less old enough to take care of themselves, so it wasn't a hard job. Two came and went, and no sign of either one of them. By four, I had left several messages. By five, their other celebrity friend came by to pick up some of his stuff that he had left behind a few days earlier. He mentioned a restaurant and handed me a 20 telling me to hang on in there as it was an important appointment. Then I crashed her important meeting with a surprise and telling her the contract was voided and to expect a solicitor to contact them since last evening both her and her husband have left. Um, unsavory messages on my phone. Next story, I, 27F, am marrying my fiancé, 29M, in a traditional Indian wedding. My sister, Sarah, 25F, is having a Christian wedding around the same time. Sarah asked me to tone down my wedding, postpone it, or make it a fully Christian ceremony to avoid overshadowing hers and to reduce family stress. I've been planning my dream wedding for over a year, and changing it now would be a huge inconvenience and financial burden. Despite understanding her concerns, I refused her request, leading to accusations of selfishness and threats from my mother to boycott my wedding. Am I wrong for standing my ground to have the wedding I've always wanted? Sarah asked if I could either tone down my wedding, consider postponing it, or even make it a fully Christian ceremony to balance things out. She believes that having two weddings so close together, with one being significantly grander, would take attention away from hers and create unnecessary stress for our family, who will have to juggle both events. I told her that I understand her concerns, but I've been planning this wedding for over a year, and it means a lot to me to have it the way I've always imagined. I also pointed out that our cultural backgrounds are different, and both weddings will be special in their own ways. Additionally, postponing my wedding would be a huge inconvenience and financial burden for us, given the extensive preparations and bookings already in place. Our wedding dates are three weeks apart. We have separate guest lists, but there is some overlap with close family and mutual friends. My mother is siding with Sarah and believes I should change my wedding to a fully Christian ceremony, or at least incorporate significant Christian elements. My father, on the other hand, supports my decision and believes that both of us should have the weddings we want. Sarah was very upset and accused me of being selfish and not caring about her feelings. I, 29 female, married my husband Alex, 29 male, three years back. We knew each other from high school but weren't friends then. After high school, we both went our separate ways. I met Alex when I returned home after completing college. I was dating my ex then. I saw the potential for marriage in my previous relationship but it didn't work out and we broke up. I was grieving for a few months. Alex supported me throughout my difficult phase. Once I recovered from the grief, I started going out with Alex. It was easy because Alex had seen me at the worst point of my life. He had witnessed my vulnerable side and so I was very comfortable with Alex. As we got more serious, I invited Alex to my home. He got along well with my parents and sister. They liked him. Another weekend, he invited me to his mother's home. His mother was widowed at a very young age, and she never remarried. Her whole life was centered around Alex's upbringing and education. Alex understood this and has always given importance to his mother's well-being. Alex and his mother lived in separate living spaces but in the same yard and they both had access to each other's houses. The dinner with his mother went fine. I realized that she was a proud mother. She had nothing else to talk about but Alex. I felt happy that we shared great affection for him. In my mind, I accepted her as my mother-in-law. A week later, Alex proposed to me and we got married. After marriage, I moved to Alex's home where he was staying. Alex had a very deep connection with his mother. Even after marriage, at times he stayed over at his mother's place. She was very dependent on him for several things. Alex was in charge of grocery shopping for his mother and driving her around. On some nights when his mother visited us, they both stayed up late to talk and watch TV. This was the time I wanted Alex to spend with me. So, in my head, I began to feel Alex was prioritizing his mother over our marriage. I never complained about this to him. I knew that Alex and his mother had lived together since his childhood. It could be difficult for her to let go of him just like that. So, my twisted head suggested that the only solution left is to make his mother love me more. I thought that would take the load off Alex's back as his mother would ask me to help her with groceries and stuff. This could also bring me closer to him and save more time for me and Alex to spend together. Alex and I made a decision about raising children back when we were dating. I wanted to be a mother. Alex also shared his love for parenting a child. During a one-on-one -on -one talk, my mother-in-law had given me a speech about the importance of having a child. She said that it was the duty of each woman to bear a child and to raise the child even in the absence of a father. She was talking about herself, though I did not think that it was a woman's duty to bear a child. I didn't tell that to her face. I told her that I was ready to become a mother. I sincerely believed that I would get pregnant in the next few months. The next few months were my attempts to please my mother-in-law, but she was never excited to see me. The only time she showed some enthusiasm was when she talked to me about grandmotherhood. She even named my unborn child before I conceived. 
If I'm recollecting well, the name she gave him was Noah. She inquired about him as if he was alive. I felt creepy about it. Sometimes she would ask me when Noah was coming. Other times it would be about her parenting plans for Noah. She was obsessed with my unborn child. I brought this up with Alex. He thought it was adorable. Since Alex didn't care about how disturbing it was for me, I decided to let it go. When my mother-in-law suddenly stopped bringing up Noah in our conversation, I was surprised. I asked Alex if he had told her about our conversation. He said yes. I asked him why he felt it wasn't necessary to talk to me before revealing our private conversation with his mother. Alex stared at me for a few seconds and said, She's my mother. I'll tell her everything. I should have realized right then and there how messed up my life is. This was a huge red flag, but instead I blamed myself for not being this emotionally connected to my mother. I continued making efforts to stay in my mother-in-law's good books. On the other side, Alex and I were finding it difficult to conceive a baby. We had been trying for at least three years by now. I suggested seeing a doctor, but Alex was hesitant and asked me to wait a few more months. I also felt that not being able to produce a child was making me look worthless in front of his mother. My thought process was still skewed with my head pushing me to do things that would please my mother-in-law. That is how I decided to throw a surprise birthday party for my mother-in-law's 50th birthday. Yesterday was her birthday. My plan was simple. On the night before her birthday, I invited my family and my mother-in-law's sister's family. A few friends of mine and Alex were also present. We gathered at our home the day before yesterday. I didn't let Alex know about my plans much because I was sure he would accidentally leak them to my mother-in-law. Alex came to know about it only when the guests arrived at 10 p.m. I appointed him with the task of waking up mother-in-law and bringing her to the party. She was genuinely happy to see these many people turn up for her birthday. We were waiting for it to turn midnight to cut the cake. But I think I was desperate. I wanted to let her know that this surprise party was arranged by me, so I decided to give a speech. I began by saying how marvelous she is. I also talked about the solid relationship between Alex and his mother. Then I talked about me arranging the party. I finished the speech by saying that I wished to do this surprise party thing as a yearly tradition. Then I asked my mother-in-law to make a speech. Her speech started with a dig at me. She took my final point about doing this as a yearly thing. With a sheepish smile, she said that she could see another beautiful woman hosting this party in the coming year. There were a few laughs here and there, but I felt like she meant something. My face went pale. When I looked at Alex, I saw that he was trying hard not to look at me. I immediately asked him to come outside. I asked him what her comment was about. He denied it being anything serious for the first five minutes. That was the first time Alex was seeing me this angry, so he was visibly shaken. He tried to go inside, but I blocked his path. He looked lost, like a child who lost his mother's hand in a crowd. When I pressed him further, he opened up to me. His mother had convinced him that I was infertile. Alex's mother used to push him regularly about having children. She wanted to see her grandson before dying. One day, she asked him whether I had disinterest in having children. He stayed silent for a few seconds before answering that question. But she interrupted by saying that she always knew how much I hated raising a child. She accepted that as the truth. And Alex did not dare to correct her. Such assumptions and guesses about me have ruled that woman's brain for the past few years. That could be the reason for her hostility towards me. Her recent conspiracy was my infertility. Her son Alex was not infertile. She was sure about it because she raised him right. He was the perfect son. She told Alex that I was infertile. Again, he did not deny it or agree to it. So my infertility was established between them. Now she's pushing him to divorce me and marry someone who could conceive a baby. She convinced him about divorcing me and asked him to find an ideal woman. Upon his mother's advice, Alex was trying to find another woman to marry after divorcing me. For a second, I reflected on myself. What was I doing? For the past three years, I have been trying hard to make a lady love me who might have hated me the moment she saw me with her son. I wanted to get back at her somehow, so I rushed inside. I could hear Alex asking me to stop from behind me. I did not. As soon as I was inside, I walked up to my mother-in-law. She was just finishing her speech, so I took over immediately. I tried hard to make the speech that I made not sound like a hysterical rant. During her speech, she talked proudly about not remarrying after her husband's death. I used this point and called her out for keeping her son in her hand. I told people about how she was destroying my marriage. I also blamed Alex for not standing up for himself. My mother-in-law was still calm. She stood up to say that she was annoyed at me for not giving her a baby. Back when I was in my previous relationship, I got pregnant once. Since there was no viability of raising a child, I had to abort the fetus. Alex was the only person who knew about this. I knew that. Among both of us, Alex was the one having trouble. That's why I didn't push him to do tests and treatment. I was ready to give him time. But now, both the son and the mother have decided to push me out of this marriage, claiming that I was infertile. 
So I narrated to the people present and finally called Alex to confirm whether it was true or not. Alex was trembling while he answered it was true. I saw that my mother-in-law was losing it. I took her birthday cake and threw it at the wall and asked her to get out. She was scared and walked out immediately. Alex tried to go behind her, but I blocked him from doing it. I wanted to see how she dealt with emotions alone. I felt happy that I had saved my self-respect and left home with my parents and sister. This happened the day before yesterday. Today, Alex called me. He cried more than he talked. His mother was not talking to him and that was driving him insane. He told me that I was the one to blame for ruining the relationship between him and his mother. His mother's sister also called to tell me how I shouldn't have been this inconsiderate to a woman who had lived almost all her life alone except for her son. My parents are on my side, but even they tell me that I shouldn't have gone this hard on a weak woman, though I know how crooked she is. Their comments are raising my confusion. Am I the A.H. for calling out my mother-in-law who destroyed my marriage by turning my husband against me? Mother-in-law called me. From her words, I understood that she cared nothing about me or my failing marriage with her son. She denied her son being infertile. She challenged me to take a fertility test with Alex. I have no intention to continue in this marriage, but I just want to give another thrust to this woman's ego. The fertility test is done. As I guessed, Alex has issues with his reproductive system. My only sadness is that I couldn't see my mother-in-law's reaction to these results. Meanwhile, Alex has been trying to get back with me. He has even started blaming his mother in voice notes and calls, but I have no plans to go back. Today evening, mother-in-law sent me a photo of a very gorgeous woman and told me that she'll be her future daughter-in-law. I just sent her back voice notes sent by Alex to me over the last few weeks. In one of the voice notes, Alex has called her an old brat. I blocked her and Alex after that. Enough drama. I'm going forward with divorce proceedings. NTA, but I blame you for remaining a bootlicker for three years. Where was your self-respect? He was prioritizing his mother over you. It's good that you realized your worth, at least now. NTA, the relationship between Alex and his mother goes back to Alex's childhood. It is impossible to give Alex a second chance because it will take a huge amount of time for him to get out of the toxic dynamics with his mother and break that pattern. A dependence of this magnitude will make it difficult for Alex to hold up relationships even in the future. My husband Dean, male 23, and I, male 22, have been married for almost four years. We live across the country from my family, so we usually get excluded from family events, but my mom invited me this year. I didn't realize the invitation hadn't included Dean and brought him with me. Before I start, Dean has an adopted brother. They found each other as children who needed support and have been inseparable since. His brother and I have gotten very close and I consider him to be my best friend. We got baking supplies Dean needed to bake the various things he would be bringing to the dinner and went to the house. As soon as we arrived, my oldest brother was surprised to see him and even commented on it, which we both brushed off. I was put on babysitting duty over my nieces. I had met the older two once and had never met the youngest, but still, I had to babysit them. I did my best to watch over them and play dress up. I make a pretty good fairy princess if I do say so myself, but when we were outside, I could see my mom, sister-in-law, and her mom interrogating Dean from the kitchen window. When the girls finally had enough and decided to bother their dad, I went to find Dean who told me about some of the questions he had been asked. Highly personal questions like our sex life, his mental health, and his parents' death. I was disgusted, but he told me to drop it and just get through dinner. I was willing to drop it until his answers were used to put him on blast in front of the entire dinner table. The sister-in-law's mom told the dinner table about a disgusting rumor she'd heard about Dean and his brother being incestuous. I told them it wasn't true, but it made my blood boil, but he grabbed my hand and told me to eat. I listened, but they didn't stop. My mother used his mental health diagnosis as a joke. I was beyond pissed and ignored Dean to ask what their problem with him was. My mom outright told me that she had never invited him and that I had brought him without thinking about how that would make them feel. I demanded they tell me how they feel about my husband, and the sister-in-law's mom once again brought up the rumor. My mom nodded and said she didn't feel comfortable around incest. I once again told her that it had never happened, but she once again said she hadn't invited Dean. I turned to my dad and asked his opinion, but he just shrugged, so I picked up everything Dean had made for the dinner, and we left. Dean thinks I did the right thing, and I think I handled the situation to the best of my abilities. But my oldest brother, his wife, her mom, my mom, and my dad think I'm the bad guy and that I need to apologize. I figured I need an outsider's opinion, so Reddit? Uh, ITA, do not apologize, of course they are all going to side with one another. Bullies always do. Unless you are super interested in getting an inheritance off them in the future, don't go back. Stay away. Disown your parents and question who, or even how, someone can come up with an incest story. Get away. NTA, if you're married and invited someplace, then spouse is part of the invitation, unless explicitly excluded, which would be adequate grounds for declining the invitation. 
Your mother is T.A. and your father is spineless for not calling her out on her rudeness. Personally, I wouldn't talk to them again without an apology and would not set foot in their house for quite some time. My parents are very wealthy and during the pandemic purchased a very nice house, desert home, and moved there permanently. It was very expensive, about $2 million. I'm not saying that to brag. It's an important detail. Of course my parents want my family and I to visit them. My husband and I are in our early 40s and I'm currently pregnant. Their house is lovely, but there's a huge problem. The guest bedroom where we stay has no air conditioning and it's extremely hot. We've stayed in the past and I've literally been awake all night sitting in my sweat. We've brought fans, which makes a small difference, but honestly not much. Given how expensive the house was, I asked them why there wasn't air conditioning in the guest bedroom, given that the rest of the house had AC. They laughed and said they weren't sure, something about the system not working quite right. They said it's not a priority for them to fix because they don't spend any time in the guest room, and they don't want to deal with having contractors at the house. I told them how actually it's quite hot in the room, and would they mind if I brought a window AC? They were extremely against this and forbid it, saying it would damage the window. I've more or less dropped it because it's not my house and not my business. However, we've been having this conversation for more than a year and it's gotten to the point where my husband and I visit much less because it's so incredibly uncomfortable and we don't sleep at all. They are well aware of the problem. They're annoyed that we won't stay with them more but haven't done anything to fix the issue. Over Thanksgiving, I called and asked if the EC situation had changed. They laughed and said no, I told them no big deal, but my husband and I will be staying at a nearby hotel. My parents were furious and told me I'm being a huge a hole about the situation and that Christmas is about spending time with family. The times that I've stayed with them, I am a literal zombie the next day. It's awful. Up uh, ITA, if I stay in a hotel for Christmas because they refuse to fix the AC, they've also put about $1 million into the house, including landscaping, a new kitchen, a pool, but have neglected to fix the AC system. NTA, I would tell them this. If you think it's no big deal and you want us to visit and stay there, then swap rooms with us because maybe what we find intolerable is workable for you. If you can't see your way to do this, then you understand perfectly why we can't stay there and you know what to do about it. NTA and you should have done this much sooner, like after the first sleepless night. If there's an option for a hotel or nearby Airbnb type stay, go there. Your parents aren't necessarily AHAs for not having air conditioning. I stay with friends and family who don't have AC, but it's out of their budget and they're not AHs about it all and I can visit when it's not too hot. But they are massive H's for being upset that you won't stay with them when their hospitality sucks and they could fix it, but won't. Next story I, 31F, have a friend, 32F, who will call Z for the purposes of this post. For background, Z and I have been extremely close since elementary school, to the point we called each other sisters, and our fathers worked together for years before that. Needless to say, I was close with her family as well, and spent a lot of time with both her parents and her siblings, as well as her grandparents. I was always over at their houses, I attended events at their church, and we did a majority of things throughout school together. In high school, Z met her now husband, who we'll call JJ, was a couple years ahead of us, and they spent a lot of time together, and soon her entire world revolved around him. Her priorities completely shifted, she changed, and I wasn't sure if it was for the better. I felt a bit off around him, uncomfortable, and voiced my concern at one point, but quickly backed off. I thought perhaps I was just jealous, my antisocial introverted side was popping out, or something equally ridiculous. I wanted Z to be happy, and I didn't want to lose the friendship, especially for what I thought was a stupid reason. So I made an effort to get to know and be friendly with Jay, though I still kept a little bit of distance. Fast forward a bit, Z gets pregnant with Jay's baby our junior year of high school, and marries him right out of high school. I should probably mention, Z's family is super religious, as that plays a role in all of this. They settle into married life and have another kid. Around this time, I go through some, we'll just say rather traumatic shit. My life completely falls apart, and one of the first people I go to, one of the first people I tell, is Z. I stay with her and her family for a bit, including Jay, until I get back up on my feet. Months later, after I'd left, Z comes to me and asks to talk. Of course I say yes. Context, we're 18 and 19 now, she tells me she talked to her husband, and they both wanted to help me learn to trust men again. This throws me off, because I told her in confidence, and she was one of only maybe three people total I had told, and she thinks her husband would be the best for that job as I knew him and trusted him. I didn't really, but I couldn't tell her that. When I asked Z what she meant, she said she thought I should have sex with Jay so I could learn to trust men again. Mentally I'm going what the literal fuck, but I just ask her if she's serious, and she can't possibly be suggesting I have an affair with her husband. She doubles down saying she's been so worried about me, and I obviously wasn't doing well. I really wasn't. I was about as low and messed up as it gets, struggling to get through each day and scared of my own shadow. 
We argued about it for a bit, and she let slip that she was also worried about her husband cheating on her, he'd done it before, and she'd rather know who he was sleeping with. All of this, on top of all the shit already going on in my head, threw me for a major loop. I'm not proud of it, and I'm sure a lot of you will be horrified, but I eventually cave. I can't even begin to say why my therapist had a field day with that one when I finally told her a month ago. I instantly regretted it, it made me feel worse than ever, and it has haunted me ever since. She has brought up doing it again a few times since, but I am so glad I can honestly say I immediately turned it down every single time. Again, fast forward another six, maybe seven E years, we're in our mid-twenties at this point, I'm so sorry I can't remember exact ages, and after a few hospital visits and years of therapy, I'm doing quite a bit better, not perfect, but getting into a better place. I hadn't spent as much time with ZJ or their family as I used to, but I still went to every birthday, every baby shower, etc. Z has four kids at this point, and she wanted to try for a fifth, apparently she'd seen some kind of trend online about a pregnancy buddies, basically women getting pregnant at the same time with babies, and doing all kinds of shit together, like joint baby showers, birth announcements, classes, shopping at Teta. Z thought this was the best thing ever, and knowing I had talked in the past about wanting kids and a family of my own someday, came to me saying she wanted me to be her pregnancy buddy, I really didn't want to destroy our friendship. So I tried, somewhat, calmly explaining why that wouldn't be a good idea. I wasn't in a relationship I wouldn't agree to be knocked up by a random stranger, I wasn't in a place financially or mentally slash emotionally to properly support a child, it wouldn't be fair to the kid to bring it into the world when I wasn't ready for it. She insisted everything would work out and I couldn't wait for everything to be perfect or I'd never have any kids. Z said I could get money from the government for any babies I had, and I wouldn't have to get pregnant by a stranger since Jay had already offered. And also, he could be a present, active father in the child's life, or he and Z would adopt the baby if I didn't want it. I really tried explaining to her everything wrong with this plan. First, how could she think I'd give up a baby? She more than anyone knew how much I always wanted kids. Second, how the fuck would we explain any of this to either of our families or all the kids involved? How would her hyper-religious family react to me having my best friend's husband's baby? How would we explain to Jay and Z's kids, each of whom I'd held the day they were born and been around their whole lives as auntie? And how would I explain to my hypothetical baby when they were old enough? Third, I would never, ever rely on government funds to raise my child. I couldn't do it, couldn't just provide the bare minimum with no control myself. So yeah, she didn't absorb any of that, was so adamant that it would work, and then mid-conversation via text with ZJ jumps in, calling me and starting the whole thing all over again. He's super enthusiastic about the idea, won't listen to any of my arguments, even less so than Z did. They both pushed me to consider it, told me to get back to them, and over the next couple of months, they tried again a few times. After all of that, I had a hard time facing them. I went to less gatherings, I started communicating less, stopped responding to texts, asking about the whole pregnancy buddy thing, then any texts at all. Z did end up having another baby, and I've never met him, and I haven't seen her and her family in several years. It hurts. I miss her kids. I miss her parents and grandparents. I miss the friendship we had. Recently, Z reached out to me again and told me she's been struggling, that she's having a hard time. I won't give details here, as that's not my place, but I felt like an absolute ass not being there for her. I did respond and talked for a very short time, because I still care for her despite everything. She was my best friend for years, but I haven't spoken to her since, and I feel so incredibly guilty. I spoke to my therapist about it, but she's focused on my mental health, not Z's. So I feel like it isn't an unbiased opinion. Am I the asshole for ghosting Z and her entire family? Am I wrong for not being there for her while she struggles when she was there for me? I'm so stuck in my head with all this that it's driving me insane and I really need some perspective on this. I feel like maybe I overreacted or maybe it isn't as big a deal as I think. Though to me it all seems so unbelievably crazy. Please help, I would appreciate any honest feedback. My husband and I got married two months ago. We are both from different cultures and ethnicities. In his culture, living with his parents is normal. We had discussed moving in with his parents after we got married, but I wasn't very comfortable with the idea. I was born and brought up in America. My parents moved here in their 20s to achieve their dreams. When I was 19, I moved out, and they supported my decision. So I told him that I disliked the idea of moving in with the in-laws. He told me that it was an important part of their culture. I told him that I respected our cultural differences, but that I wouldn't compromise on this. I wanted us to have privacy, and I had visited his apartment. It wouldn't fit all of us. Now, at this point, I thought that his parents lived with him. He had made it seem that way, too. He had told me that he grew up here. We eventually compromised, and he asked me to try it out for a few months. And if I wasn't comfortable, then we could move out. So I agreed. We had a small ceremony when we got married, 
but it was beautiful. I moved into his apartment, and his family was extremely sweet. I didn't feel anything was wrong. His mother and he would frequently talk in their native language, and I would be curious. I asked him to teach it to me too, but he would refuse and say it wasn't necessary. I told him that I wanted to be a part of their conversations too, but he still wouldn't teach me. Time passed, and I took a few classes online, but I was still learning. I only understood a few phrases and words. My husband and I both worked. It had been about a month and a half into our marriage, and my mother-in-law kept telling him to get it done. That's the one phrase one understood. When I would look at him, he would just awkwardly smile at me. I could feel that something wasn't right. I would ask him about it, and he would always just blow me off, saying that he would tell me later. As the days passed, my mother-in-law got more anxious about it. I tried asking her, but she wouldn't give me an answer either. I was fed up with it. We hadn't even gone on our honeymoon yet. I wanted to go abroad, but he would blatantly refuse and tell me he was busy with work or make up a similar excuse. One day, I was speaking with a co-worker of mine. She was from the same country as my husband, but I hadn't heard her speak her native language. I randomly asked her if she spoke the language, and she said yes. I asked her if she could help translate a few lines for me, and she said of course. I knew it wasn't right, but I was going to record them. I've lived with them for almost two months now and I don't particularly like being left out of conversations all the time. I knew something was up, and I was going to find out what. When I went back home that day, I did my normal routine. Once my husband was back, my mother-in-law started speaking fiercely to him. She sounded angry. I immediately started recording their conversation. The next day, I met up with my coworker during my break. I made her listen to the recording, and her eyes widened. She didn't know who was speaking. She asked me who this was, and I told her it was my husband and my mother-in-law. She told me to immediately get out of there and call the cops. I was shocked. I didn't know what to say. It couldn't be that bad, right? I asked her if she misunderstood anything, and she said no. She proceeded to explain to me that my mother-in-law was pestering my husband to open a joint account with me and to take note of how much money I had. My jaw dropped. What the frick? This lady, my mother-in-law, didn't speak much to me but acted very sweet. I always thought that she was just a reserved person. My co-worker continued to tell me that my mother-in-law was pestering my husband to apply for a green card. She said that my husband was almost yelling at his mother to keep her voice down and kept explaining that for a green card. He had to show proof that I was able to support him financially. She then told me that she kept screaming at him to get it done. I didn't know how to react. I remembered my husband asking me to create a joint account, and I had refused. I made more than him, but he wasn't aware of that. I wasn't comfortable opening a joint account with him just yet, as I had a few of my prior investment plans that needed to be completed. I hadn't disclosed everything to him, and right now I was thankful that I hadn't. I wasn't aware that he didn't have a green card either. He told me he grew up here. My coworker pulled me into a hug. I didn't notice that I had started crying. She told me to report it to the police and file for an annulment. Divorce was not an option in this case. I went home early that day and packed up my stuff. I had informed my father, and he was on his way. My mother-in-law wasn't home, but my father-in-law was. When I rolled my bags out, he tried to stop me. He asked me what was going on, but I just ignored him. My father had come up by now. He was enraged, but was keeping calm because of me. I went back with him to his place. I contacted my father's lawyer and filed a report the same day. My husband called me multiple times that evening. My lawyer recommended not talking to him. This was fraud. One thing my co-worker very clearly mentioned was something my husband had said. His exact words were, Why do you think I married her? Have you seen her house? It's huge. She doesn't know that I don't have a green card. I'll have to coax her into believing my story. We're married now, but we need to wait to make our move. Looks like that a whole forgot that annulment was an option. The audacity they had to speak all of this out in the open right in front of me. It's a good thing I have proof. I don't know how long this will take, but I'll update you all soon. Update 1, 6 months later. The annulment of my marriage has been granted. You should have seen his face when he knew that I knew. I can't believe I got sucked in by him. I actually thought he loved me. I wanted to ask him why, if he actually ever loved me but the answers were all there in that recording. My lawyer warned me not to contact him during that period. It was better that way. My parents could see how shattered I was over this. I couldn't help but think that if I hadn't recorded them, 
I would have never known. I would have never thought about this happening or that these were his intentions. I know many of you have asked what his native language is and which country he is from. I haven't mentioned that information because I don't want to promote any stereotypes. Of course, charges were pressed against him and he had to pay for them. There are a few other things I cannot make public. What I can tell you is that he won't get away with it. There are chances that he and his family may get deported. His parents were here on a visitor's visa anyway. I'm still staying with my parents. I don't trust them one bit. I'm very grateful for my coworker. If it wasn't for her, I would have never known, and that's horrifying to me. I'm just trying to move on now. Thank you all for your support. Dana. At first, I thought OP was stupid to just trust the coworker's word, but then I realized I was stupid. Nobody would joke about a situation like this. It's a good thing she got out of there ASAP. While reading this, I was praying that OP wouldn't confront them by herself like in those dumb movies. Good thing my gall is smart and just quietly packed and got out of there. Santa, I feel so bad for the OP. Poor girl. I can't imagine anyone going through a situation like this just two months into their marriage. But on the bright side, it's better she found out now than later. Not gonna lie, it would have been terrible if OP confronted him by herself. These types of people, who knows what they're capable of. For the people saying that she should have done more research on his background or found out more about his family, do you all realize how good he must have been to get her to marry him? OP doesn't seem like a fool either. She followed her gut and instinct and found out what was going on. She even tried to learn their language. Of course, her intentions were good when she did so. But these asses, his whole family were in on it. This is fraud. Good thing she got it annulled. A divorce would have been problematic, Danta, and that is why you never disclose your finances fully. She got emotionally played by him. I hope OP and her family can move on and live a better life. Poor people must be traumatized by this experience. Next story. My brother is 13 years older than me and I have known my whole life, all 19 years, that he would have preferred to remain an only child. We are not close. He has never had time for me, never wanted me in his life or to be in mine. When he moved out, he stayed distant from me. He'd speak to our parents, visit them, but it was like I wasn't there. Over the years, I got used to it. One time when I was like 12, our parents asked him if he would let me stay for a weekend because they were attending an adult-only wedding. He said no, but he didn't just say no. He was clear that he would never want that kind of contact with me. They argued back then over it, not sure how bad it got, but they never asked again and nothing changed between me and him. It always stood out to me that he was almost disgusted to be asked and by the idea that he would need to spend some time with me. He never showed up to my birthdays and never got me anything for Christmas or my birthday. My parents were bothered but always told me once we were both grown, our relationship would be more equal and could grow. I think they wanted to believe that more than they actually did. My brother has been with the same woman for like eight years. I've met her a grand total of two times. Now they're engaged and everyone is all excited. His fiance came over while I was at my parents' house for Christmas and asked me to be her bridesmaid. She brought up how they needed to include me since all of her siblings were bridesmaids and groomsmen. I asked if that was the only reason and she went silent because, I mean, she was asking a stranger for the sake of appearances. So I told her it was nice to offer and all but I couldn't accept and that I wouldn't be attending the wedding. She freaked out and went crazy about how my lack of attendance will overshadow the day and sometimes you go for family. Even if you're not close to you or know the family because family is important, I ended up having to leave my parents' house because they were also unhappy when they heard that I was planning on not going. They told me he's my brother and I should be at his wedding even if I'm not a bridesmaid. Aita? Edit some stuff has come up commonly and I wanted to add some extra details. My brother is very close to our parents. He always has been and they know his fiancée very well since they've seen her a lot. I was just simply never included in that. But my brother never appeared to have any hard feelings toward our parents, only ever me. His fiancée has admitted she only invited me for appearances sake and that my brother said no to including me in his wedding party. My brother and I look very alike, which is a mix of both our parents. I have seen pictures of my mom while pregnant with me, so unless they really faked those, he's not my bio father. I've had more of a conversation with Redditors posting on this than I've had with him in 19 years. Dana. It might be a good idea to expand on what you've written here and get them to read it. Emphasize the hurt and how dehumanizing it is that brother, sister-in-law wants to use you in this way after how he's treated you. Plus point out the obvious double standard on claiming you should do him favors because he's family, when he would never do the same for you. Denta, your parents are enabling his appalling behavior. You not having a relationship with your brother is no loss. OP, as the way he's behaved throughout your life, jealous, entitled, and spoiled, means he's not a very nice person. I can understand him getting his nose put out a joint when you were born, but he has no excuse now. You must have been incredibly hurt over and over as a child, 
and in some ways it must have been difficult for your parents too as they must love you both. But now he's an adult and has reaped what he sowed. You're not his sister nor family because he doesn't want you to be. His fiance will be aware of his feelings towards you and is just as nasty as him, M.O. To expect you to happily join the wedding party where you would have no doubt been made to feel rejected, not worthy to, and then have the audacity to flip when you politely refuse. Your parents need to stop enabling his atrocious behavior. You seem quite level-headed despite the effect this long-term rejection must have had on you. OP. I hope it doesn't affect the various relationships you will have in life. I'm proud of you for sticking up for yourself. Din. I also think it's weird that some comments are saying sister-in-law doesn't know, but after eight years and never buying gifts for birthdays and holidays, never calling or visiting, Never including in on plans for things or events, she knows. Like, seriously, how could she not? Maybe she doesn't know all the logistics because obviously if he told her how cold he could really be and they want kids, then him acting this way would be a huge issue. It's not a charming quality to possess as a grown man to make it blatantly obvious that you are incapable of loving an integral family member that literally did nothing but exists. Can you imagine how he would be as a parent if he didn't like his child? Which happens, people. Let's not deflect from the fact that many people can have children and feel nothing towards them but contempt. Anyways. OP. Frick that shit and don't let your parents' opinions dictate your attendance. Sister-in-law can frick off because she's a weirdo too. Next story. We live in Alabama for the past week. Our mornings have been 30 degrees and warming up to mid-40s. I don't think we've seen 50 degrees for quite some time, when we were married. He conceded to a request that I made that our two-year-old child during the winter months be adequately bundled up and always wears an undershirt to keep her chest warm and a hat to keep her head warm. That means at all times during the winter, she's wearing a minimum of two layers on her chest and has a hat on her head when she's outside. The reason why I say he conceded to this is because he loves cold weather and it has always been the shorts, hoodie and flip-flops kind of guy during cold weather months. Well, since we divorced, he's basically thrown that out the window and refuses to put an undershirt on our child. On my weeks, she is always wearing one and I always send her to his house fully clothed with one on. When I get her back the next week, he has her dressed in maybe pants, t-shirt, and a jacket. The final straw was this week, I was off work and he wasn't and daycare was closed, so he asked if I could watch her. I said, sure, no problem, just bring her to daycare mommy at normal daycare time to keep her schedule. When he dropped her off, I about blew a gasket because he had our two-year-old dressed in a sweater, nothing underneath it, and shorts. That's it. Took her inside immediately and put some clothes on her and asked him why in heaven's name is she dressed like this. He said that she was only outside for five minutes so he saw no point in putting a full outfit on her. I reminded him that it's winter time and her body is still learning how to regulate temperature and she needs to be covered. She also needed at least a shirt underneath the sweater because what if she got hot and we took the sweater off? She'd be naked. He just shrugged and went about his way saying it's not that serious. I called his mother who I'm still on good terms. I told her what happened and she was furious. She called him and scolded him telling him to at least have two layers on the child just in case. He then texted me back calling me all types of dramatic and what not saying it was uncalled for to talk to his mother. But I honestly felt there was no other way to get through to him. Ada? ESS. You lost it. You have a bit of a control freak in you. No coats with car seats. Safety? We live in northern New York and don't even own a winter coat for the one-year-old. I wrap him in a blanket to carry him out, buckle him in, and throw the blanket over him. The undershirt thing is your problem, honestly. You need to let go of a little control there. As your child walks and probably plays outside, she should have a coat at least with her, but 30 outside a warm sweatshirt in the car would be fine. Skirts expose legs like shorts do, but somehow they're better accepted in winter LL. I never understood that. If someone wants to wear shorts, then whatever. I'm not saying your two-year-old should, but sometimes that argument isn't worth having with a toddler if you are in a hurry. And when you can toss a blanket in the car, you don't actually get sick from the cold and she wouldn't get frostbite that quickly. If he had nothing warm for her at all, that is crappy but her not having it on wasn't. But you don't get to dress her at dad's, and this is how you make co-parenting a nightmare for the next 16 years. Pick out a nice soft fleece blanket that she can be excited about and get two of them. One for your car, alone for daddies. Denta. He is being straight up neglectful of your child. I don't know how I would get through to him either, but it seems his mom couldn't either as he still thinks he's in the right. Maybe have him speak to a doctor, but yeah, absolutely tough for trying to make him see sense in any way possible. Ida. You sound like a control freak and this sounds like the perfect way to push your child's father out of their life. 
make dealing with you so awful they just give up. I'm not sure what your obsession with an undershirt is. When all you're doing is walking from building to car to building, you don't really need to bundle up like you're going cross country skiing. Thanks for watching till the end. Wishing you an awesome day. Feel free to drop a comment if you've got more to share. I'd love to hear from you.